Please stand as we listen to our sermon text this morning. God's grace, his mercy, and his peace are yours through the knowledge of our Lord and Jesus, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon text for our meditation is recorded in your bulletins on page 10, Matthew 21, verses 12 through 17. This occurred during Holy Week, on Monday of Holy Week, after Jesus rode into Jerusalem on, on Palm Sunday. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read? From the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. This is the word of our Lord. You may be seated. Dear children of God who rejoice in his triumphal entry into his blessed city of Jerusalem. There's a pastor with a large family who likes to tell the story of one hectic Sunday morning. He and his wife were getting their kids ready to leave for church and his eight-year-old son was unable to find his belt. Both mom and dad looked for the belt and time continued to pass by. They were unable to find it and things got more and more Hectic as the time for the church service drew near and the pastor himself was going to be late all because they couldn't find this belt. And his son, who was about eight years old, turned to him and said, Daddy, did you pray about it? And those words, that question, just took the wind out of that pastor. Who was it? that had taught this young man for the past eight years to turn to his Savior and speak to him in times of trouble. And who was it who remembered to apply that lesson in a time of trouble? Throughout our Lenten meditations this year, we've been looking at things in Jesus' passion that are ironic. An irony is when something happens, an outcome that is the exact opposite of what you would expect. You would not expect an eight-year-old to take a pastor, a minister, to task on such an important fundamental of faith as prayer. But that's exactly what may happen. And that's exactly what happens in our text for this morning. These children take the chief priests, the elders, the, the, the teachers of the law to task on a basic fundamental of faith, recognizing their Savior. We see our irony this morning in those words from the Pharisees and the teachers to Jesus. Do you hear what these children are saying? In the Bible, God doesn't always tell us exactly how he feels and thinks about an incident that's recorded. He often lets us wrestle with what's good and what's bad, but here in these words of our text, he gives us a very clear opinion from him about the things that are happening in this morning's lesson. Matthew writes for us, But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things that Jesus did. What does that word wonderful mean? Of course, it means good and great, exceedingly great things that Jesus was doing. But the, the original word there written in the Greek actually means even a little bit more than that. It's something that causes people to wonder. Jesus was doing things there in Jerusalem during Holy Week that were causing people's mouths to drop open. People were amazed at what he was doing. And what were these wonderful things that he had done? Well, of course, coming into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey with 
crowds before him and following him, shouting his praises. Yes, that was, of course, a very wonderful event that happened. But this incident that we're reading about in our text for this morning takes place the next day, on Monday. Matthew doesn't make that as clear as the Gospel of Mark does. This is Monday of Holy Week. Jesus is going to be arrested on Thursday night, crucified on Friday, and rise again on Sunday. And Monday he was in the temple. And what did he find there in the temple? It was full of these money changers and merchants, people selling animals, animals bleeding, cows, sheep, doves, making a bunch of noise. In God's temple where Jesus says people were supposed to be praying and worshiping him. See, what would happen is during this great big festival of the Passover, people would come from all over, thousands of miles they would travel, from all over the known world at the time. Wherever people believed in Jesus, it was a requirement, or believed in the coming Messiah, it was a requirement for them to make the trip to Jerusalem and be there for the Passover festival. But it was allowed for them, if you were traveling, especially from very far, that you didn't necessarily have to drag that little lamb along with you the whole way. You could take some money with you, and when you got to Jerusalem, you were allowed to buy the lamb that you would eat or sacrifice for that festival meal. But the Jewish priests did not want to get paid with anybody's money from Egypt or Rome or Greece or Babylonia, or India. They only wanted to get paid with Jewish shekels. So inside the temple, you would come and you would give them your foreign currency and exchange it for the Jewish currency with which you could pay your temple tax and buy the things that you needed for the festival. And if you've ever been to a money exchange, you know that there is a percentage that is taken off the top. And while the Bible doesn't talk about it, it is very clear from other writers at the time that the Jewish priests, the people who worked at the temples, the teachers of the law, they took a cut off of the top of that money exchanging that was going on. That's part of the reason why they wanted it to happen, why they demanded that it be paid in Jewish currency, was so that they could take a little bit off the top. And Jesus comes in, sees this going on, and overturns their tables, pushes them out and says, get out of here, this is a house of prayer. And he accused them of stealing from people, of being thieves and cheats. This wasn't even the first time Jesus did it. This is the second time Jesus pushed the money changers and those selling doves and pigeons out of the temple. He did it earlier in his ministry, in fact, very early on in his ministry, and here he does it just the week before his suffering and death, like bookends on his ministry. He does this amazing thing, this wonderful thing. Only the chief priests, they didn't see it as wonderful. Other wonderful things that Jesus was doing, our text tells us about, the blind and the lame came to see him at the temple, and he healed them. People who needed healed came to Jesus as he was teaching at the temple, and he healed their diseases. Jesus had been healing people for three years and yet this one last time he's doing it, just a few days before his ministry ended, before his suffering and death. And there was one other miracle that Jesus did that day. He elicited the praise from believing children. Children were running through the temple courts shouting those praises, Hosanna to the Son of David, just like the crowds had done the day before on Palm Sunday when Jesus had entered into Jerusalem. They were filled with joy and still singing that, those exciting words. All three of these wonderful things mean the same thing. They should have been clear to everyone who was around. They were messages they all said, see, the one that you've been waiting for is here. Jesus is here, the promised Messiah, the one talked about in the Old Testament. The word that the children were singing is a word that comes from the Psalms. Hosanna means the Lord saves us. It's a traditional welcome for the promised Savior. It's written about again and again in the Old Testament. And the title, the Son of David, the King of Israel, 
who is the one who was coming to set God's people free. And that's what these, peop- these children were singing to Jesus. But they weren't singing these things on their own. The Holy Spirit, who had worked that faith in their heart, was bringing out these praises from these children, bringing forth these fruits of faith. And that's not ironic. We expect God to work as he has promised through the word to change hearts and open our mouths to sing his praise and open our lives to show our love for him. The irony is on the other side. That with all of these signs that were going on, with as clear as it was to these children, to these kids, that there were people there who didn't see it. Matthew writes for us, But when the chief priests and the elders of the law saw the wonderful things that Jesus did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the Son of David, they were indignant, they were angry, they were upset, they couldn't believe it. These were the experts These were the teachers of the law, the people who were not only supposed to know God's word the best because they had their noses in the Bible day in and day out, but the ones who were supposed to teach God's law to the people, the ones who were supposed to share with them the good news, the promise of the Messiah to increase the anticipation of seeing the one who was to come. And yet, for them, when the Savior arrives, these are the very ones who don't recognize him, who don't see the signs, and refuse to believe. The children saw their Savior, the theologians, the intelligent people, the learned ones. They missed it. My friends, it's no different for us today. The intellectuals, those who are in positions of authority, often do not recognize Jesus as their Savior. And think of people like us who believe in Jesus as the Savior of the world, the Savior from sin, the Savior from death and hell. They think of us as just stupid, foolish, childish people who need to believe in a Disneyland in the sky to keep us happy through the sufferings of this life. Many people today, and sadly even many pastors, many people who claim to be Christians, Do not believe in Jesus, the Savior from sin, as these children did. They will not accept a Savior who suffered and died and rose again to give us eternal life. They don't believe that God came in the flesh to pay for our sins. They deny that the Old Testament prophesies about a Savior who is going to come and rescue us from sin. And that's very sad. Because God lays it all out so clearly for us through his word. And yet all over the world, people refuse to see it, refuse to believe it. Why? They don't see it because they don't want to. People today will believe anything. They'll believe that humans evolved from monkeys or fish or algae on a prehistoric pond. They'll believe so much of what you tell them, as long as it's written somewhere on the internet. It seems like people are so gullible, they'll soak up anything. God talking to you through your feelings, telling you the things that you want to hear? Oh sure, yeah, that sounds good. A God who wants us to live together in peace and just get along with each other? Yeah, that sounds great. But a God who suffered and died, a God who shed his blood for us, who died on a cross like this one 2,000 years ago, who rescued you from an eternity of suffering in hell? No, no, that could never be. No. Then why not? If that's so clearly what the Bible says, why won't people believe it? Because that cross means that there is an absolute standard of right and wrong that everyone is held to and that we must admit that we have not lived up to and that we deserve to suffer its consequences. And people in today's day and age, people in Jesus' day, do not buy that. They think, especially today, that right and wrong really mean just what's best for me in my situation right now. Eternal standards, though, absolute rules, 
No, people just won't swallow it. Because it would finally mean that we would have to admit we have done something wrong. That I have been wrong. That I have sinned and that I am guilty. We would all have to admit that. If there is a Savior from our sin. You know what? Simple Christians all over the world who see Jesus with the same faith as these children, this childish faith. Yes, would we be willing to say our faith is childish? Yes, we recognize our Savior who came to give us peace. We trust in Him because He loves us. And if that's childish, call me a child. They know the only answer. We know the only answer for the guilt that we feel in our hearts because of our sin and the hurt and the sadness that sin brings into our lives is Jesus. He is the only remedy, the only answer. And yes, that does mean that there is a right and a wrong. Sin is rebellion against God. And the simple, humble Christian has no problem saying, yes, I have rebelled against God. And I do deserve His wrath and punishment. But Jesus rode into Jerusalem to be your Savior and my Savior. Palm Sunday is the beginning of the end of Jesus' earthly life. Five days after he rode into Jerusalem, after they hailed him as Hosanna to the Son of David, some of those same voices, perhaps, shouted out, Crucify! Crucify! as they pushed the Roman governor to put Jesus on a cross. There's another irony, a thick irony, in Jesus' suffering and death, that those same voices who hailed him were also the ones who encouraged him to the cross. But Jesus wanted it to happen. He wasn't a victim. Jesus wanted the Romans to nail him to a cross. He wanted to hang there and be abandoned by God. Jesus wanted to die because we have broken God's absolute law. And that was the only way to erase our record of sin. Unless Jesus hung on that cross and suffered his Father's wrath for us, unless Jesus suffered an eternity of hell and punishment on Good Friday, all the people on earth would be doomed to hell. So Jesus did some very wonderful things that last week of his earthly life. He rode into Jerusalem, and the next day he healed the sick, he cleared out the temple, and inspired the children who believed in him to sing their song of praise that told generations then and now the truth that their Savior had come to take their place. He has paid for all of our sins. God has forgiven us. He has given us our eternal life. My friends, do you hear what these children are saying? See and understand these wonderful, wonderful things. That question, do you hear what they are saying, often means that someone's in trouble. Maybe it's been used in your house before. I'll give you an example. A family from out of state came to visit some of their other family members here in Wisconsin. And the the cousins from out of state thought it would be funny to teach their 18-month-old Wisconsinite cousin to say, Go Bears. And of course, every time he said, Go Bears, those older boy cousins would rolling on the floor laughing and the little child thought that was pretty funny. But after they left and headed back home as that 18-month-old continued to say, Go Bears, his mom and dad would look at each other and say, Do you hear what your son is saying? That question often indicates that someone is in trouble. It's almost always a rebuke. And that's what the Jewish leaders meant when they rebuked Jesus with that question, do you hear what these children are saying? These men were were disgusted, horrified, that these children would call Jesus the Messiah, and they thought that Jesus maybe would be disgusted with them, that he would be embarrassed, that they were calling him the Savior, the promised Savior. But once again, they failed to understand God's plan. And so Jesus very lovingly fills them in. Have you never read? He said, From the lips of children and infants, you have called forth your praise. 
Jesus not only heard what those children were saying, he approved of it. He was very glad, and he wanted those Israelite leaders to recognize what the children was saying and what it meant. This is a quote from Psalm 8, Psalm 8, verse 2, a prophecy about how God was going to come to this world as a humble man, leave his throne of glory and come here to save us. God taught his people in that psalm that he treasured the praise of children because it comes from faith. And most Jewish people in that day would recognize this quote that Jesus was saying as a prophecy of the coming Savior. And so Jesus quotes it at his enemies once again, showing them, yes, all of these signs point to me as the one that you deny, the coming Savior. And the Israelite leaders didn't know what to say. Jesus left them and went out to Bethany where he spent each night with something very important he gave them to think about. Earlier in Jesus' ministry, he had taught these men that only those who have the faith of a child were able to see the kingdom of heaven. And now he reminded them that it is the faith of a child that brings God the praise that he's looking for. And these leaders were missing it. God elicits praise from children's lips. What does that mean? Now going back to that pastor and his son, the, the son who encouraged his dad to pray for the belt, it's God who causes things like that to come out of our children's mouths. Through baptism and through the word, the Holy Spirit is at work in those children's heart through the gospel message that they hear here at church, in their Lutheran elementary school, in Sunday school, in vacation Bible school, and at home from their parents and grandparents. God, through that word, reaches into their hearts to fill them with joy and trust in their Savior. And when you tell them something about, your, about their Savior, they trust the words that you say. When you tell them to turn to God for every need to come to Him with your cares, they listen to the words that you say. Be careful, though. They also watch the things that you do. When parents, grandparents, Sunday school teachers, Lutheran elementary school teachers, and pastors teach their children that God answers all of our prayers and that we should go to Him when we need help, those children take our words literally and believe them. That is the faith of a child that Jesus praises and talks about. Why is it so much harder for us adults to just take the words that Jesus gives us and just believe what he tells us because he loves us? Children so willingly and eagerly do that, and yet us adults, we poison our minds with doubts and questions when children take it at face value because they know it comes from someone who loves them. Where can adults get faith like these little children? There's only one place. And then one place is the gospel. The gospel that we hear in God's word, that we hear here at church, that we sing in our hymns, that we read in our homes, that we share with our children as we read them our devotions. The gospel works in our hearts as Jesus makes those promises to us personally as we are assured yet again that his death and resurrection count for us, that they mean eternal life for us. The gospel is filled with God's promises that work in our heart through the power of the Holy Spirit to increase faith and increase our trust in him. And when we trust in him, we will turn to him when we were, are in need just like those little children. God is is the one who gives us faith. And every time we hear that gospel message, God renews and strengthens that faith in our heart. And through that gospel message, a change happens not only in our hearts, but also in our lives. God brings out of our thankful hearts songs of praise and actions of praise and attitudes of praise for him. We praise God in all of the ways that we trust in him. We praise God all of the times that we turn to him and ask him for his help. We praise God when we lift up our voices and sing to a Savior who has loved us and changed us and made us his. We praise God in every way that we serve him and serve our neighbors throughout our lives. Dear friends, 
Praise the Lord. Let that praise come out of your hearts in all the different ways and opportunities that God has given you to praise Him. Praise Him because you are His. And the beauty of this lesson is that God reminds us that He Himself is the source of our praise. If He can ordain that praise from children, He can do it from us too. My friends, do you hear what these children are saying? Join them in their songs of praise. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you.